Good evening, everybody. Is this switched on? Good evening and a very warm welcome to our um, Good News for Real Life session. If we've not met, my name is Santosh. I serve as one of the pastors at Dundonald. It's really great to have you here. Thank you for coming. And um, this is our second of this series of events. We hope we'll run something similar um, each term. And, and as you, I hope you'll know, this session we're thinking about anxiety, which we'd planned it months ago. As it happens, this is not just a kind of specific issue for a few of us. This is an issue everybody um, feels in one way or another. And so we hope this evening we'll have plenty of time for practical pastoral care and, and support and guidance from the Bible. Just so you know, this is very much set up from a Christian point of view. So we believe the Bible's God's word and we're trying to think, what does the Bible teach us on this issue? Um, and, and we hope that'll be a huge help to us all. There will be a chance for people to text in questions. And that's the web link there if you would like to at any point. It'll pop up at various points um, because we'll have a panel um, with Helen Thorne who'll be presenting for us in, in a few minutes' time, and Clayton Fopp, who's also on the team, and, and between us, we'll be trying to take questions later. So please do text them in, and we hope this will, will, will be helpful wherever we're coming from. We're conscious for some of us, these, this anxiety will be a very personal struggle that we face ourselves. Others, it may be um, supporting friends, loved ones, spouse, children, and we hope that tonight's teaching will connect with all those situations. As we begin, let me lead us in a prayer, and we'll ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, we pray as we come to think about a topic that is hard and, and potentially overwhelming for us in so many ways, we look to you as the sovereign Lord to be our helper and our teacher, to be our rock and our refuge. And we pray that as we come to listen to your word and what your word has to say to us, we would be ready to receive from you and ready to hold out the good news that you have for us. So please be with those of us who speak. Please be with all of us as we listen. And we pray that we might help one another with thoughtful questions and helpful answers as well. And we pray that this evening might be a helpful next step wherever we're coming from. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I said, we hope this evening, considering this topic of anxiety, will be helpful um, because it is a painful issue that many of us face in lots of different ways. You know, of course, with, with this virus at the moment, it's something our whole culture is having to deal with, anxiety. Not just, not just our country, the whole world. Um, you may know the World Health Organization called um, the coronavirus a global pandemic now. And this series that we're running is called Good News for Real Life because we really believe that what the Bible has to say to us is good news. Good news about Jesus Christ that is life-giving and life-sustaining, even through the most painful, harder situations of everyday life. The gospel is good news for real life. Whatever you or I or our loved ones are going through right now. But I think the danger can be for many of us that we, we focus on ourselves or our problems. Understandably, it's very big. Um, but it can become all about me when we think about these topics and so any God talk or Bible talk can turn into just a sort of slightly spiritualized version of self-help with me at the center but of course the Christian good news has God at the center God is the, the beginning and the end he's the primary focus of the Bible the first cause the final goal so knowing him is the adventure and the privilege and the hope of the Christian life and there is the sense that I truly will understand myself and the world and my own struggles only when I come to see him truly. Therefore, each time we run a session like this, we try to begin for the first few minutes just thinking specifically about who God is. Who is this God of the Christian faith? The one who we believe is and offers good news for real life. And this evening, we, we remind ourselves of Surely one of the most precious, practical truths when it comes to any issue of pastoral care, whether it's a worldwide health crisis or a personal mental health struggle, we remind ourselves that God is sovereign. So these first few minutes, we're just going to think, what does that mean? Because I think if we get this in focus, if we readjust the, the lens of our minds and our hearts, well, then these other issues, all other issues, will fall into place. See, it's tempting, isn't it, when life feels hard and, and we feel overwhelmed, to ask the question, where is God in this? 
you done that? It's a very normal question that we ask, often through tears. Where is God in this? And the answer, according to the Bible, from the beginning to the end, is he's not out of control. See, whatever you or I face, God Almighty has not lost his seat in the control room of the universe. He hasn't gone to sleep at the wheel. He's not waiting for a software update before he can turn his laptop on and get to his to-do list. He's not been taken hostage by terrorists or a global disease or corporate greed or my sin or anything else. In every circumstance of life, the Lord God is sovereign, which means absolute goodness is in absolute control. The, the psalmist writes, why do the nations say, where is their God? That question, where is God? He writes, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever pleases him. The Apostle Paul, you may know, after his glorious and deep exposition of the Christian gospel in Romans, Romans 1 to 11, at the end of that, he bursts into praise and wonder at who this God is. So Romans 11, he writes, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. So where is God? The psalmist tells us he's in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. Because for from him and through him and to him are all things, the beginning and the end and the goal. That is to say God is sovereign. And if we want a slightly fuller account of this, we turn to Daniel chapter 4 in the Old Testament. Let me read these words. You may know it's, it's an unlikely account that comes from the mouth of a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he, he basically was in charge of everything. He, he was a very great king and ruler, and, and actually that almost was his downfall because he, he thought he was on top of the world, and he said this, Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? He's saying, look at what I've done, this great empire, look at me. But then immediately we're told, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for, decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken away from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to whoever he wishes. So he goes from the highest, most luxurious palace to living with the animals, like a wild animal eating grass. And instead of those perfect pedicures and manicures from the palace beauticians, we're told his hair grew long like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. You see, he thought he was like God, but he ended up like the beasts. But what was it all meant to teach him? Well, it said, seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth, and he gives them to whatever, whomever he wishes. And we're told exactly what God said would happen. But at the end of the time, Nebuchadnezzar said, I raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, I honored him and glorified him who lives forever. Here are the words that this pa once pagan king said. He said, his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Imagine that from the lips of this notorious, almost almighty, once pagan king. We're taught about the sovereignty of God. See, the reign of King Bab of Babylon will come and go. The reign of Nebuchadnezzar will come and go. But the most high God, he has an eternal dominion. A kingdom that endures from generation to generation. See, like, we like to think we're great. Um, our political leaders tell us they want to make our nation great again. But actually, it's the sovereign Lord who is great forever, for all time. Now, so the Bible teaches us, therefore, that God is sovereign. 
in control of all things, all power, all wisdom, all authority, all dominion. But why is that good news? We might instinctively think that might even be bad news. Why did God, if God is in control and all this bad stuff happens, is it God's fault? Did he, why, now of course the Bible does teach us God can't do evil. He's not the cause of evil. And yet he is sovereign over all things. And the reason, there's so many ways in which we can do it. Just very quickly, a few reasons why this is good news. God is sovereign. What does that mean? Well, it means this world is not out of control. The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of mankind. He does whatever he pleases. And that means even coronavirus or politics or cultural revolutions or education policy, all these things are not outside of his control. And of course, as we think personally, that means my life is not out of control. It's out of my control often, sure, but it's never out of his control. It also means, therefore, that God's will cannot be defeated. I don't know whether you've thought about this, um, but imagine just a kind of little thought experiment. I imagine for a moment that God wasn't completely sovereign over everything. Imagine if there was just one little molecule in the universe that God wasn't sovereign over. I don't know whether you're a kind of scientific person, but just imagine with me one molecule that God, he can't control that one. All the other ones he can, but this one molecule is, as I've called it, a maverick molecule. Just one like that in the universe. What happens? Well, actually, anything could happen. That molecule bumps into another molecule, which bumps into another molecule. See, we thought God was in charge of all the other ones, but if he's not in charge of this one, well, what happens if this one goes rogue and, and messes up one of the ones that we thought? Turns out he's not in control at all. All it would take is one maverick molecule, and all bets are off. Anything could happen. God can't guarantee anything. You know, he's got, he's got this plan. He, he knows what he wants to do in the universe, but this one maverick molecule could mess up the whole thing, which means nothing's safe. And yet, of course, what we've just read from the Bible tells us there is no maverick molecule. There's, there's no maverick molecule in the whole universe. Everything, every atom, every quark, every electron, every hair and heartbeat and fingerprint and respiratory tract and hospital bed and medical advances under his sovereign control. God's will cannot be defeated. And of course, again, as we say that, as we talk about God's will, we can hear that in a very abstract way. Maybe it's just power, a force, and maybe that's, we think, gosh, that's dark. Do we... Do we but of course, if we know who this God is, he's gracious and kind and compassionate and just and merciful and power. He loves righteousness and hates wickedness. He's perfect and pure in every way, which means his will is perfect and pure in every way. That one and that will will not be defeated, which means wonderfully that all his promises will come true. Do you realize that? Because he's in control, all his promises will come to pass. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We're told all things work together for the good of those who love him. Because he's sovereign, that's true, and it will happen. And of course, as we think personally, if you're a Christian believer here, then this sovereign Lord is mine, and I am his it's not just the power that controls the universe. He's my Lord and my King, which means if we think of God, the sovereign Father is my Father. Matthew's Gospel says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your Father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. The sovereign Father is my Father. And the sovereign Son is my shepherd. Of course, the Bible tells it he's my prophet, my priest, my king, my bridegroom. He, he's all these things, but, but he's also my shepherd. And if you've been with us in John's gospel, we're told, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. And of course, the sovereign spirit is my comforter. We're told those who are led by the Spirit of God, our children of God, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirits that we are God's children, the sovereign Lord. 
is my Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so that great chapter, the eighth chapter of Romans, ends like this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, there's no maverick molecule. From the very beginning, God's plan from creation at the beginning, every step in between right through to the new creation at the end, all his promises will come to pass because he is sovereign. And that is good news for real life including the very real struggle of anxiety as we live very much in the middle of that story. We see over and above it all, God is sovereign. He's the sovereign Lord. He's the one we know. And if we're Christians, he's my Lord. Why don't I pray now and then we'll hand over to Helen for the next part. Lord God, we are glad and humbled and strengthened to know that you are sovereign no matter how life feels to us now, no matter what our own situations and struggles are, we know that you are sovereign over the kingdoms of men. From generation to generation, you are in control of all things. And, and we pray now as we consider this issue of anxiety, you would be our helper and you would comfort us and you would do all the things that only you can do. And please give us a greater, deeper confidence that you are sovereign, you are Lord. And in Christ, you are our Lord, and you're working for our good. So be with us now, we pray. And be with Helen, please, as she comes and teaches us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a dream. Not in a grand Martin Luther King kind of sense of the word. But I have a little dream, a dream that I will get to the end of every day and feel content and not torture myself about the silly things I said earlier on. I have a dream that I can get through the night without waking up at two o'clock in the morning in a hot sweat, regretting something that I've done. I have a dream that I can look at my diary and go, yep, that all fits really nicely. I can handle all of that. I have a dream that when that curveball of a phone call comes, that my pulse remains steady and calm. I want to be honest with you at the start of this evening. I am not living the dream. Like many of us here, many of us who aren't here, anxiety has been a feature of my life for as long as I can remember. And what we're going to do in the next 40 minutes or so is look a little bit at what anxiety is, how it feels, uh, some practical strategies that we can put into place. Uh, but then, probably about half the time, spend it looking how actually soaking ourselves in God's word and turning to the Lord who loves us most can be a transformational thing. There will be a little bit of chatting to your neighbour, but just in case you might feel anxious about that, none of that is going to be fed back to the front so it gets recorded. Uh, so just want to calm any anxieties uh, about that uh, just before we begin. Well, to start us off then, what is anxiety? There we go. Well, at a simple definition, it's a fear or apprehension at future events, either real or perceived, that impacts body and heart. And I guess most of us know that. Sometimes we're anxious about something that really is going to happen, that exam that's happening in a few weeks' time, that driving test, that uh, job interview, that presentation that we've got to give. Sometimes there's a very real object of our anxiety. And sometimes it's just something that might happen. Maybe the day is not going to go okay. Maybe I'm going to say something stupid. Maybe at the end of this evening, when the recording goes online of Good News for Real Life, I'll be sitting there, Helen, why? Why did you actually say that? That wasn't even in your notes. 
But if you feel any of those feelings, if you can relate to any of that at all, uh, then you are alongside 8.2 million other people who are struggling day by day. In England and Wales, uh, women are almost as twice as likely to be diagnosed with anxiety disorders as men, but that might just be because sometimes men find it a little harder to talk about how anxious they're feeling. And at any given moment in time, uh, just under 7% of us in England will be feeling anxious. Well, working on the assumption most of us know exactly what that feels like, why don't we just have a little short 30-second talky bit uh, with the person next door just to get us loosened up for a bit of conversation. Chat to the person next to you, twos, threes, whatever happens to work for where you're sitting. What does anxiety feel like physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually? Just about a minute, less than a minute with the person next door. Okay, let's come back together again. Not quite sure what you were talking about, but I'm guessing you were covering sort of areas like there were physical manifestations of anxiety, the sweaty palms, the gastrointestinal joys that come uh, with feeling very nervous about something to come, the, the palpitations, the, the muscle tension that can be in our necks. Or maybe you were talking about some of the emotional effects, that feeling of being overwhelmed, of wanting to withdraw, about feeling you can't actually go out the door that day because it all feels too hard. Concentration just goes out of the window. Maybe you were talking about some of the relational aspects, uh, not wanting to withdraw from people around you, not wanting to engage, or maybe wanting to run towards somebody that you trust and hold on tight to them because you feel that might be where you can find the security uh, that you need. Or there might be spiritual factors too. A lack of assurance, despite having heard brilliant Bible teaching for years, suddenly beginning to doubt that God could accept you, God could love you, God could want you anywhere near. Of course, for children, it can include things like bedwetting. It can include uh, uh, getting very grumpy and, and just being very defiant because they're so scared of what they're being asked to do. They want to withdraw and, and just say, I'm going to stay in. I'm not going to do anything that I'm asked. It can result in being very withdrawn and shy and not wanting to play. And those things can go from very mild to being very severe. There can be sort of a... a a kind of anxiety that is all of us experience from time to time, through to a, a generalized anxiety disorder, through to much more specific things and serious things like post-traumatic stress disorder. But in the midst of all that, anxiety tends to whisper lies, and we believe what those lies say. Things like, it's all out of control. I'm all alone. I can't do this. I can't cope. I'm not going to get through. They may be things that theoretically we know aren't true, but they feel real in the heat of the moment. Or those feelings, those lies, aren't nice to live with. And so most of us in anxiety try and escape. We try and do anything we can to mute those feelings of anxiety because they're just horrible to live with. For some of us, if we're adults, we might try and control the situation around us. Now, I'm not talking about just a right measured, let's make sure things in their proper order so we can get through. I'm talking about really controlling. You know that moment of anxiety where you come home and there is a single plate left on the floor and that single plate left on the floor feels like the ignition of World War III in your brain. Now, we know that single plate left on the floor is not a big thing. 
But in that moment of anxiety, it feels huge. And you think, if you can just have a tidy house, if you can just make sure everything is in order, then maybe anxiety will feel a little less. For children, that's where their defiant behavior might kick in. For others of us, maybe it's food. It might be deliberately not eating as an attempt to control something. If we can control what's going into our body, maybe we won't worry so much that everything else feels out of control. Or maybe it's comfort eating. I remember a, a particularly tricky period in a, a, a previous job uh, where the pressure was on. We were working ridiculously long days. The, the stakes were really high. And my PA popped into, the, uh, office, m into my office uh, and with a big smile on her face, knowing that it was going to be a, a, a really wretched day for me, just wryly said, Helen, is today a one packet or a two packet of ginger nuts days? Just want to know if I need to go shopping or not. She knew that my tendency when things were really tough was just to do this with the biscuits on my desk. Of course, for others, it's alcohol or drugs or sex or pornography. Maybe it's shopping. Retail therapy sounds so innocuous, doesn't it? And maybe that pair of shoes will make us feel just slightly better for a few short moments. But it doesn't actually take the anxiety away. Or maybe it's things like gaming or scrolling, just numbing our mind as we look at picture after picture on Instagram. Or maybe if you're a little younger and more techie than me, playing these online multi uh, role playing games, just pretending to be someone confident online. All right, I feel a mess in the real life, but, but on that game, my avatar can be confident, I can achieve something, I can be top of the league rather than feeling at the bottom of the pile. Or maybe particularly in churches when we don't want to go to things like alcohol or pornography or drugs. Sometimes, just sometimes, we spin ourselves into a whirlwind of overactivity. If we can just do everything, maybe we can get a sense of purpose and maybe we can drop into bed so exhausted that we don't even have to begin to think about our feelings. Sound familiar? Well, I'm hoping I'm not alone in some of those things. But as Christians, do you ever get that feeling that maybe you shouldn't struggle with anxiety? That maybe the fact that we've got this sovereign God that Santosh was talking about should mean that anxiety goes away? I mean, aren't we meant to live this victorious Christian life uh, where we're trusting in God uh, wholeheartedly? Well, why don't you uh, turn back to a neighbor? Again, this is not going to be shared to the front. What have you ever heard or what have you ever thought that might give you the impression that as a Christian... Maybe it's a little shameful to struggle from anxiety. Maybe it's something that we shouldn't do. I'm not saying that's what the case is, but if you've ever thought that, just share that uh, with someone nearby. together again. Sometimes it's uh, our own minds, sometimes it's the word of someone nearby that causes us to think like that. And of course Jesus did say, do not be anxious about anything. But sometimes I think we hear Jesus' word in a slightly wrong tone of voice. He didn't bark an order, don't be anxious. He's actually leading us through a pathway, through a world of anxiety, 
And he talks a lot about anxiety because I think he knows we're going to struggle with it. Anxiety is a real part of this fallen world. You see, we live in a broken world with very real challenges. We live in a world uh, where our bodies aren't working, our past and our present and our futures are uncertain. Our desires can be going in a whole kind of different directions. You see, if I were to do a survey of everybody here, and I was to ask you about your past, for every single one of you, you will be able to tell me a story of something that hurt. If I were to do a survey of how you're feeling now, I could get a story from every single one of you about how you're struggling right now. If I would talk to you about the future, I could get a story from every single one of you about what you're worried about. And some of those worries are very tangible and very clear, and some of them uh, are just very remote. In the dark corners of the night, I look at my life and reflect on the fact that I have no brothers and sisters, no, no parents, no husband, no children. And I say to myself at three o'clock in the morning, Helen, you are going to die alone and get eaten by your cats. And my friends who know that my love language is mockery will often say, yes, Helen, that's exactly how it's going to happen. I, I wind myself up by worrying about the future. But it's not just our experiences that nudge us towards anxiety. We've got broken bodies as well. Our, our hormones aren't always doing what they're supposed to do. Some of us might have a genetic predisposition uh, to anxiety. Some of us might have an underlying illness or, or taking medication which pushes us towards anxiety. There are very real physiological aspects to any experience of anxiety. And as well as living in this world where things are broken, this world where personally our lives are broken, this world where our bodies are in some way broken, well, our hearts are broken too. Often we're going after things and wanting them more than we should, or, or wanting things that we don't, shouldn't want at all by God's standards. And we pursue things wholeheartedly and then get anxious when we can't grab them. Maybe we want to be rich, and whilst money in and of itself is not wrong, if a love of money is projecting us to do all kinds of silly hours at work, then that can lead us towards anxiety as well. It's all those things mixed together that can produce the experience of anxiety. And as we look at those different components, we can maybe see why different ones of us are feeling different about the coronavirus. There is a very real threat, if you like. The World Health Organization doesn't use the word pandemic easily. Uh, the World Health Organization doesn't talk about, you know, a threat to our society, the greatest in our generation, lightly. But even with that baseline of facts, different ones of us will be reacting to it differently. So some of us will have broken pasts in the sense that we've got a, a, a lowered immunity or a health struggle, which means that actually we are more nervous about getting the virus because it could be more serious in us. Some of us uh, might have broken pasts. Maybe um, we had swine flu, which is not the same, but not too far away, uh, when that hit in 2009, and that was a really painful experience for us, and therefore we're worried about the present Maybe some of us have a broken desire that says, actually, I have got to be in control of my own destiny. And therefore, the 17,000 toilet rolls in my living room are entirely reasonable. You can see how our different backgrounds, our different presents, our different futures, our different bodies, our different desires will all fuel different levels of anxiety in us. Well, if you go to the doctor, which of course is no bad thing to do if you are struggling from anxiety, then they're probably going to push you in one of these different directions. There can be self-help, online relaxation techniques, coping strategies, talking therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. Medication can be wonderfully useful. Mindfulness uh, is something that's prescribed quite regularly, whether you're an adult or whether you're in a school. And all of those things are wonderful gifts from God in terms of common grace. There is no shame in being on medication for anxiety if that's what we need as Christians. There is no shame in engaging in any talking therapies if that's going to help us get through. But we need to be aware that these common grace therapies don't include everything. Well, most notably, they don't include Jesus. And they ask us to find solutions to our anxiety inside ourselves rather than looking to the one who knows us the best and loves us the most. Well, what can we do? 
if we are feeling anxious or if someone we love is feeling anxious? Well, here are a few little techniques. Breathing, most of us have mastered it, one of life's basics. But you'll notice if you breathe from uh, the top of your throat, the top of your chest, your breathing will be very shallow. And if you keep doing that as you get more and more nervous, well, you can actually almost wind yourself up into more anxiety by your shallow breathing. The more you can breathe from your diaphragm, the more you can actually calm yourself down. A simple physiological technique, in through the nose, out through the mouth, nice and slowly, in moments of anxiety, especially at three o'clock in the morning when you don't want to turn the light on, can be a wonderful thing. If we're feeling panicky, grounding techniques can be great. Count back from 100 whilst tapping your thumb against each of your fingers. The, the counting really focuses your mind on the here and now and stops it spiraling away into other things. And the tactile nature of just touching your fingers will help bring your body into a state of awareness of itself and again, stop your thinking, spiraling her down. If you're out in a public place and someone's having a panic attack next to you, ask them to, to look around them, find five things they can see, four things that they can hear, three things uh, that they can touch, two things that they can smell, one thing that they can taste. Just focuses people on the here and now and calms them down very nicely. Meditating can be useful. I think as a church, I would want to be encouraging us to meditate on God's word. And if we're into coloring, maybe get one of those Bible coloring books where we can color in a, a Bible verse. It's not that I'm against unicorns with positive thinking, but I think if we're looking for something that's really helpful, we want to flee to Jesus uh, rather than a rainbow. Uh, and we can be good at resting actually taking that day off every single week. I am slightly hypocritical saying that. Uh, but actually, if we can discipline ourselves to rest regularly and actually live in the pattern that God designed for us, then our anxiety probably will subside. And for children, that will mean them having real creative fun where they can use their imaginations, where they can make things, where they can play outdoors. We can do some reprioritizing. I learnt a few years ago, uh, and you may disagree with my decision here, that life was okay if I didn't iron. I have now actually got rid of my iron. For years it was just in a cupboard. Now I don't even own one. There are moments when I look a little bit tatty, but you know what? I'm owning that, and it's given me so much extra time to rest. may not be an option for you, but consider what you can actually give up. We don't have to say yes to everything. We can cancel things or rearrange. We can take exercise, exercise that doesn't push us to achieve, exercise that's just fun. Or we can journal or engage in art. Or if you're working with your children, get them to tell stories through their toys about how they're feeling about their day. All of those things are great gifts, wonderful techniques to put in place. But as Christians, I think maybe we want to be looking at what the Bible says. And whether you're here for yourself and you want to say these words to you, or whether you're here for someone in your growth group or your family or your circle of friends, these are words that you can say to others. And they're in three short categories. Words that root, words that refine, and words that relate. Well, let's look at each of those categories uh, one at a time. Santosh has already uh, started us off with this. And they're words that root us in who God is. Because if we think the world is out of control and God doesn't care about us and there is no plan, then this world is going to be a terrifying place. But if we can genuinely see who God is, then not only will we have a different framework for our experiences of this life, but we'll also have someone that we can run to with absolute confidence. You see, one of the lies that anxiety screams at is, is you're all alone. But what the Bible reminds us is God is with us and he cares about us and we can talk to him at any time. Whatever we are going through, whatever our children or our friends are going through, we are not going through it by ourselves. We have a loving savior, a sovereign God who is right there by our side. And he's not inactive. He's not just kind of observing our anxiety and, pa in pass and passively standing by. He's helping us in that anxiety. He's, he's being a refuge that we can run to. 
I watch a little bit too much of Lord of the Rings, please don't judge me. Uh, but I love the big battle scenes, especially the scenes where people are instructed to flee to Helm's Deep or something like that. And the wonderful thing about being instructed to go to a refuge is it's a place where you go messy. You know, if, if the battle cry comes and, and the marauding army is coming towards you, you don't stop and do your hair. You don't do the washing up. You don't make sure your living room is nice and tidy. You just run. And that's what God wants from us. People that in the times of anxiety are just hardwired to run to him because he wants to be a protection in times of trouble. He's also our shepherd leading us through. Anxiety can feel so confusing, we don't know which way to turn, but he is the shepherd leading us one step at a time through the difficult times. And that is how shepherds work, isn't it? Leading one step at a time. Shepherds don't put their sheep into a catapult and like catapult them into the green pastures on the other side of the stream. No, they, they walk with the sheep one step at a time through the field, through the mud, through the river, over the other side into the green pastures where it's calm. In God, we have a shepherd who leads. And we have a God who provides for us one day at a time. Often anxiety says, I don't have what I need in two weeks' time. But God says, but you have what you need for today. And tomorrow I'll give you what you need tomorrow. And the day after, I'll give you what you need the day after. Exodus 16 is a, a lovely uh, passage uh, where I really relate to the Israelites because they are so grumpy and faithless. They've just left the promised land. They've seen some of the most amazing acts of God any human being has ever seen. And they're now wandering towards the promised land where life will be wonderful for them. And they are sitting, whinging, and saying things like, can we go back to Egypt? It's like, you, you were literally slaves. But we were sitting around pots of meat. You, you do remember they were killing your children, don't you? And it's a real anxiety feel to it. They don't want to go forward into the unknown. They, they much more want to run back to a horrible thing in the past where at least it feels secure. And in anxiety, so, so often we feel like that. And God responds to that by going, look, I'm going to provide for you today and provide for you tomorrow and provide for you the next day and provide for you the day after that and keep providing until I've got you home. And as Santosh was telling us earlier, God is our king, he's sovereign. And that's what I remind myself of two o'clock in the morning when I wake up sometimes with a very legitimate reason to be worried. I'll sit on my bed and I will hold that hard thing in my heart but remind myself that that hard thing is surrounded by a king that is above me, a shepherd that is before me, a refuge that is around me, a spirit who is inside of me, a community that is only a text message away. That doesn't change the hard thing but it reframes it. It means I'm not alone, not unable to cope, but I am able to persevere. But it's not just words that root in who God is that's important. It's words that root in who we are. See, we're in the image of God. We're not useless, worthless, pathetic worms that are just going to be abandoned. I mean, this isn't a L'Oreal moment. It's not that God looks down from earth and go, wow, they're worth it in Dundonald. But we are special because we're made in God's image. And if we're following Jesus, then our past is forgiven. There is no place for 3 a.m. guilt. Our present is equipped. We don't have to panic about the day ahead because God will be with us in it. The future is secure. There is no such thing as an unhappy ending for those who are in Christ. And those things are not negotiable. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die on the cross for everybody in the world except for that really irritating bunch in Wimbledon who don't have a building right now. He died for the sins of all of his children. We are clean. When that lie comes that we're guilty, we can combat it with the truth that we are forgiven. When that lie comes that we're out of our depth, we can combat it with the truth that we are equipped. When that lie comes that we're not secure, we can combat it with the truth that his loving arms are around us and he's leading us somewhere perfect. There will be a day when we don't feel anxiety anymore. But whether we're speaking to ourselves or whether we're speaking to other people, we don't just want to speak words that root. 
we want to speak words that refine as well. Ephesians chapter 4 is a wonderful uh, book of the Bible. Well, not that there are any books of the Bible that aren't wonderful, but it's a particularly useful one to go to uh, in terms of uh, seeing that process of change. It talks about us taking off our old self, having our minds renewed, and putting on our new self. Now, we don't want to hear that tritely. That's not a case of let's decide not to be anxious, let's read the Bible a bit more, and let's go forward without any anxiety. That would be trite and unhelpful to say to ourselves or to say to others. But as we looked at uh, last time in our uh, Good News for Real Life, sometimes we can imagine our struggles as a bit of a brick wall. There'll be things like, I I, I don't trust God, I'm scared, Uh, bad things have happened in my past, Uh, something really scary is happening tomorrow, my hormones are going all over the place, I, I don't know what I believe anymore, I can't pray. And our struggle with anxiety is made up of all these individual bricks of things we're thinking and believing and and worrying about and physiologically experiencing. And what we can do is one brick at a time, tackle those. And so it might be things like, oh, everything's out of control. And so we just pick that thing and say, every time I say everything's out of control, I'm going to catch myself. I'm going to catch myself and say, no, hang on, that's my old self. That's what non-Christian Helen would have said. I'm going to say, sorry, Lord, I I know that's not true. That's the taking off. And then I'm going to spend some time looking at some of those wonderful passages, maybe like the Daniel passage that Santos was looking at earlier. I go, look, no, no, it is under control, isn't it? There's evidence it's under control. And so I'm going to go forward today, maybe actually getting a lot of things wrong, but I'm going to go forward saying, Lord, I trust you because you've got it under control. Now, that's not a one and done thing. Not us, not our children, not our friends. None of us will get that first time round. We might have to do that multiple times a day, multiple times a week, for months. But eventually, it begins to sink in. For years, I had three words on a post-it note. uh, And then when my technology caught up, I put them on my phone. And those were three words were loved, secure, forgiven. The first three things I got myself to see in the morning. The last three things I saw before I turned off the light at night. And when they were first on the post-it note, it was like, love, secured, forgiven, yet whatever. That is so not me. Then after a little while, it was loved, secure, forgiven. Well, I suppose the Bible does say that. Several months later, loved, secured, forgiven. Could that actually be my reality? And then a little while later, love, secure, forgiven. A decade on, I have three completely different words on my phone. But it's not just words of refining in terms of personal changing. We want to be sharing words of perseverance as well. As Christians, we're not randomly alongside each other. We're here to encourage each other along the way. We're here to encourage each other to persevere. We want to be inspired by the Christians that have gone before us and encouraged by the Christians around us and go, keep going, we can do this. I think one of the beautiful pictures of a church is just a group of people who have linked arms and they've said, together we are going to walk through the muddiness of this life with our eyes fixed on Jesus and we're not going to stop. And when one of us falls over, we're going to pick each other up in the strength of the Lord. Let's keep going together. But finally, and most briefly, we also want to be praying through our anxiety. Words that relate. We want to say those words to ourselves, say those words to other people. More importantly, say those words to God. See, I don't know about you, but when I get anxious, my prayer is basically, Lord, take this away. And I'm not knocking that prayer. Sometimes that can be exactly the right prayer to pray. And we can ask God for anything we like. It's it's no holes barred. We can say what's ever on our minds. But if we limit our prayers to please take it away, then sometimes, well, maybe we are trying to avoid what God wants to do in allowing that circumstance or bringing that circumstance into our life. Maybe we can pray prayers like, Lord, help me to trust you in this. Maybe we can pray prayers of repentance, not repentance for being anxious or repentance for being hurt, but repentance, I'm sorry for doubting you in the middle of this. Maybe we can pray prayers of reorientation. Change me to be more like Jesus. Lord, I don't want this anxiety to be useless or purposeless. And thank you that in your great goodness, it's not going to be. But I want to participate in that. 
don't let this anxiety be put to waste. Change me to be more like Jesus in the middle of it. So this anxiety is fruitful ground for me to flourish and grow. Or maybe prayers of resurrection. Thank you, Lord, that one day I will be free. And along the way, well, let's keep talking to each other. We need each other to persevere in this difficult life. Well, in a moment, we're going to go uh, to a time of question and answer. But before we do that, there are a few resources uh, to flag up. If you're helping other people, uh, biblicalcounseling.org.uk and cceF.org are both biblical counseling organizations that have a wealth of material out there on anxiety and a whole host of other uh, pastoral issues as well. Uh, but if you're struggling yourself or you want to read a book alongside somebody, uh, there are some books there. We don't have any copies of Running Scared by Ed Welsh here, uh, but they can easily be got from Amazon. It's a great read if you're struggling with anxiety yourself. If you have trouble remembering who you are in Christ, if you feel like that worthless, pathetic worm uh, who gets overwhelmed by anxiety, Mirror, Mirror would be a great book uh, to read yourself or, or with someone that you love. If I ruled the world, every Christian would read Mirror, Mirror. It was transformational in my life. Uh, it's been transformational in the lives of many people I know. Tim Lane's uh, Living Without Worry uh, is a, a great book. Uh, it's very practical uh, in terms of how to change our thinking and, and trust God more. And then there's the course, uh, Real Change, uh, which Andrew and I uh, put together uh, here at Dundon Order a few years ago, which doesn't have to be done in a big group in church, can be done in one-to-ones as well. And of course, there's the sheet on anxiety, uh, which many of you will have seen at the back of church as you came in. Well, there's an overview of what Jesus says about anxiety. I can't promise that he's going to take the bad stuff away. In fact, I can almost certainly guarantee that you're going to face something tough in the future. I can't promise that you will never struggle with anxiety again. We're all going to struggle with something this side of heaven. But I can promise you don't have to struggle with anxiety alone. Your experience of anxiety doesn't have to stay as it is now. You can change, you can grow. God will be at work by his Spirit in your hearts. And I hope alongside me, you will get to the point where you will be able to say, I am still anxious, but I'm not as anxious as I used to be. And one day, I will be a lot less anxious than I am today. Confident that in the new creation, I won't even begin to remember what anxiety is like. Santosh, Clayton, over to you. Thank you, Helen, very much. We will have time now for questions. Helen's touched on lots of things um, with related to this topic of anxiety. Please do um, drop in questions to that web link up there. Um, people joining us on the live stream, please, jo please send in questions as well. We'll do our very best to, to pick them up over the next few minutes. What we might do is we'll just take 30 seconds now if you want to have a brief pause, um, text in a question. You can grab a quick drink if you want from the back and then we will reload with, with question time from the front with these guys. Um, please do feel free to ask anything. We'll try and get through as many as we can in the time and if there are any pressing ones that we don't get to, feel free to grab us. So 30 second break, text in, grab a quick drink and then we'll start again.
That's why I don't rather know than you guys when you're answering serious questions. Um. We will make a start on these questions. They do, they come in live to the iPad, so please keep texting in if, if anything comes to mind. And if we make a start on your question, but there's this follow-up you'd like to give us, please send that through as well. Um, this first, I guess this first one's kind of pastoral question. Helen, you did help us with, with Bible pastures already, but the question is, can you recommend some particularly helpful psalms or Bible passages, verses to memorize so that they're there in those moments of anxiety? And Clayton, Helen, either both of you help us, particular passages? Um, so I think... These might be muted. I'll just keep going, and hopefully some sound will come out at some point. Why don't you start, Clayton? Okay, I'll start. Um, there are some psalms that I think are particularly helpful at times I'm always mindful in Psalm 2 that God is in control that's a great psalm about God's sovereignty uh, not even just over individuals but over whole nations and if God is sovereign over the nations then I can have great confidence that he's sovereign and in charge even of the things uh, that might be worrying me uh, there's Psalm 121 uh, probably familiar to many of us uh, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Reminding us always to put our trust in God. I find that a great encouragement. I know lots of others do as well. There are some particular passages in the New Testament that talk about worry or anxiety. We've touched on a couple. Um, Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians um, 4 verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. And then he ties that to praying but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god and then in the sermon on the mount matthew 6 and luke 12 jesus tells us not to worry and those are good verses to have in our head so that we can remind ourselves in the midst of anxiety what god has said to us great I, I really struggle to memorize bible verses um, i just have one of those brains where they don't really stick uh, so what I tend to do is I look for either for pictures or stories in the Bible. So I will remind myself of the Bible verse in the Psalms where it talks about uh, there being a wing over us, a protection or a rock or a refuge or a, a, a stronghold. Those kind of imagery, imagery that I can conjure up in, in an anxious moment. And I also love narrative. So just reminding myself of the story of uh, Joseph. I mean, if anyone had an anxiety-inducing life, it was Joseph. I mean, just think about it for a minute. He was hated by his brothers. They decided to kill him, then just decided to sell him into slavery, which is clearly so much better. He then got trafficked to a foreign land. Uh, we got accused of a crime that he didn't commit, thrown into prison unjustly, where he got forgotten by his friends and had to languish there uh, for quite some time, only to be released in order to have an audience with the most powerful person in the known world, and then be made prime minister over a land to navigate them through a famine. I mean, how can you not be anxious at some point in that story? And yet at the end of the story, he's able to come out with a beautiful phrases like, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And, and the story of Ruth as well. You know, she, she left the only land she ever knew as a grieving widow with the grumpiest mother-in-law known to humanity and went completely into the unknown. And yet she does that in, in faithfulness, in, in God's strength, as she's saying to Naomi, your God will be my God. And so just reminding ourselves of these really normal human beings and how their faith transformed their experience of life, I find really inspiring as well. Thank you so many. And you realize as you read through the Bible, thinking about God is sovereign, God is our Father, um, are not two sparrows sold for a penny. There's so many images, phrases, things there to, to actually guide us by, by looking at who God is. Thank you. Um, this is a slightly more kind of theological one. Um, if God is sovereign, and everything is done according to his will, does that mean that God gives us anxiety? And if so, why? 
That sounds like a pastor's question. <laughs> Clayton, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah. Um, we, we know that God is sovereign over everything. We don't want to, in our trying to figure out how the pieces fit together, attribute uh, evil to God. So with that limitation in, uh, yes, God does allow these things to come to us, but we also know that God works all of these things for our good. So Romans 8, 28, a wonderful passage to cling on to, that even if I can't see in the midst of my hardship what the good is uh, and even if maybe there are times when I doubt that actually God is working it for my good uh, the Bible is very clear that God is working that for my good my ultimate good of course not just my comfort or my uh, short-term well-being emotionally but my ultimate good to make me more like Christ and to present me to Christ on that last day and so God chooses to use things that we wouldn't choose for ourselves to that end. Thank you. I hope that helps. If, if there's more on that question, please um, follow up. The, I guess we're conscious this is a very personal pastoral struggle that we, different of us will face in different ways. So these next few questions are slightly, just a more kind of everyday pastoral angle. The first is written in the first person, I suffer from anxiety. How can I ask the church for help? How, how, can a, how can the church help me if this is my issue? This question's come in. Thank you, and thank you for being open and honest in, in that forum. And I think there's going to be a lot of us here this evening and a lot of us online that could echo that wholeheartedly. Um, first ports of call might just be a, a friend to pray with. Uh, beyond that, uh, talking to uh, people in your growth group, uh, maybe meeting one-to-one. -one. Uh, the pastors uh, are always happy to chat. Uh, the care team, I, I'd be happy to chat. Um, we can arrange for biblical counselling if, if that would be useful. We can recommend books to read. Uh, we can uh, potentially get a group of you together if you're struggling with anxiety and reading a book together or praying together or uh, encouraging one another. Uh, there's a whole host of options out there. Uh, we can encourage you or even you know, find a friend to go with you to the GP if that would be useful to, to look at medication. So I think the first thing to do would just be to, to chat to maybe one of us or, or to a growth group leader uh, and just start sharing a little bit of your story. You don't have to share your whole story in the first conversation. No one's going to drag it out of you kicking and screaming. Uh, just start sharing a little bit of where you're at uh, and we can discern together how best to support you. Absolutely. And I'd say remember that while we sometimes feel that perhaps I'm the only one in this situation, in a church family the size of ours, even in the gathering sizes that each of us are a part of, there are many people who struggle with lots of things to do with anxiety. Um, and so you're not the only one. Uh, if you are having a conversation with one of the pastors or one of the care team or a small group leader, you're probably not the only person speaking to that small group leader. You certainly wouldn't be the only person speaking to that member of staff or that member of the care team about anxiety and, and asking for help. So we certainly wouldn't want you to think that you are on your own or unusual in looking for some help in, uh, in these kinds of areas. Um, if we sort of change the focus from a personal struggle, if I have a friend who struggles with anxiety but in ways that I don't really understand, it's, it's very overwhelming, but I can't personally relate to it, what, what should I do or what should I not do? in that situation? Well, a very simple uh, pastoral structure uh, that uh, a very wise man who wrote the book Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands uh, put forward was four words, love, know, speak, do. Uh, and that works for pretty much any pastoral struggle if you're standing alongside somebody. Uh, you love them, so you, you just uh, spend time with them, you, you, you go for a walk with them, you have a meal with them, just you know, be a good friend and, and remind them that God loves them. That's a, a wonderful, simple thing. Uh, no, just means listening to their story. The more you listen to what they're going through, the more you will understand. You may not have experienced it yourself, but the more you listen to somebody and, and let them tell you what their experience of anxiety is like, the more you'll get the hang of it and you'll be able to walk a little bit in their shoes. And as you're listening to their experience of anxiety, just be listening out for things like, but some of those lies that we were talking about earlier, where they're thinking things about themselves or about God or about his world that, that just aren't true. 
And that means you can then go on to number three, which is speak, and actually very humbly and very gently just go, you know what, I, I've heard you say several times that you, you think you're pathetic. Can we just look at what the Bible says about how, how God's made you to be? You, you've said you know, a number of times that everything is out of control. D do you mind if we just pray together and, and maybe look at, let's just read through Mark 1 to 8 nonstop together and just see Jesus' sovereignty over the created world, over death, over demons, over human beings, over everything. And then just think practically, love, no speak, do. Do is the last one. Do they need to come to the gym with you to take some exercise? Do they need uh, meals dropping around for them? The simple things, I was chatting to somebody at another church not so long ago who dropped out from going to church because of anxiety. And I thought, oh, is this gonna be a really difficult conversation about what's going on in their hearts? Uh, and they came back to me and said, well, I arrived at church early in the morning. I sit on the end of the row, and then the steward asked me to move to the middle. And then if I'm in the middle of the row, I have a panic attack, and so I've stopped coming. And so my simple response was, well, how about if we tell the steward you're allowed to sit on the end of the row? And they instantly said, oh, yeah, I'll come back to church then. So just think practically, what will make it possible for that person to engage with life, engage with God in very simple ways? If someone's anxious, keep the Bible... Um, bit quite limited so either read big chunks but with not much analysis so you're getting a, a big swathe or if you're going to do analysis keep it really short because concentration might be difficult uh, so don't ask them to do lots of prep often if I'm reading the bible with someone that's anxious I don't get them to do lots of prep beforehand I don't use a study guide I simply say okay we're going to get a mug of tea we're going to curl up on the sofas uh, and we're going to talk to our dad and listen to him in return read a really short passage of scripture and just go, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about ourselves? What do we want to pray about? Something really simple like that. I think that's, uh, that's very true. And also I'd, I'd only add that while it's good to know um, my own limitations, uh, when to refer someone to biblical counselling, to professionals, to... Uh, someone else in the church perhaps with more experience those are all good things to know uh, to do at the appropriate time but actually any of us can walk alongside someone can pray with someone can ask those questions what do we learn about God what do we learn about us from this Bible passage um, we don't have to be experts in the field to be loving and so really as a family this is one of the ways that we can walk through life together I think well, I think that probably does lead on to our next question, which is not from the perspective of someone who is suffering themselves with anxiety or saying, I know someone, but it's a kind of general church culture question. If our church family are suffering from anxiety, but are in themselves anxious about sharing that, don't feel able to voice that, um, what can we be doing to support people? What can we as individuals, we as a church be doing to make it easier to share that struggle? I mean, we hope doing something like this is a start, but, but other things that we, we can do to make it easier to talk. Um, I think, as you say, doing something like this helps us as a church say we want to be open about this, uh, and we've probably still got ways to go in terms of how to be more helpful and more accessible to people. But we do want to be saying this is something that we want to talk about as a church. We want to be open about our struggles in the Christian faith mm. in every area and so we can model that in our small groups in our conversations with our friends whether or not the struggle that we have is anxiety or something else uh, we don't want to be kind of putting on a putting on a mask when we when we turn up to to growth group or kg or turn up on sunday we want to be real and authentic and loving each other um, relating as family and as we model that to each other I think we'll give each other permission to respond and to share other people's struggles and and those kinds of things I think in Ephesians chapter 4 talks a lot about us one anothering with one another and actually our, our call as a church is to share lives and to spur each other on to love each other to bear with each other to to teach each other uh, all these one anothering things that the Bible has and it can be really really scary to take that first step I think especially in probably in places like Southwest London where there's this expectation that we'll be together and mm. professional and, and going through life in, in quite a competent kind of way. But the reality is, 
a, a church is meant to be a place for broken people. And I can absolutely guarantee that everyone in Dundonald is broken in some way. And so the more we can just grasp the fact that the person sitting next to us, the person in front of us, the person behind us, they're all struggling too. And so it is a safe place. Uh, we, we'll get things wrong sometimes, we always do. Uh, but it is a safe place. And, and let me just say very personally that these guys here, as my pastors, they know I am a cataclysmic mess and they still love me and they still work alongside me and they still encourage me. Uh, it is a safe place uh, to be vulnerable. It might be that someone feels that they can't ask for help or ask for direction to some useful resources or where in the Bible might be helpful to read. Um, but if they've shared with you, uh, then you could ask. You could ask the small group leader or one of the staff or care team or Helen. Um, that's one of the ways that you can say, no, this is part of how we love each other as a family. We can go and find out things for other people. We don't need to break any confidences when we do that. We can just go and ask someone, well, where would you go and look in the Bible if you were struggling with this? Or can you direct me to some useful resources that we can then pass on to the person who's come to us? Mm. A very small practical thing. Helen said um, it's easy to get the impression that everybody's sorted and fine. I think one very practical thing is, you know when you ask that question, how are you? The default answer is, fine, thanks, how are you? Um, or if I don't say fine, thanks, I might say, yeah, really busy, really busy, yeah, fine. If we banned saying fine, thanks, or really busy, it might help us stop giving that impression that we're all fine, thanks, or we're really busy, but we're fine, thanks. Um, in fact, I remember having a conversation with someone who said, how are you doing? And with a slight glint in the eye, said to me, do you want the honest answer or the right answer? And I said, what's the right answer? Well, you're supposed to say, I'm fine, thanks, aren't you? And actually, it's a really important point because when I ask that question, am I willing to take the time to hear the honest answer? Because I, give you the, I can give you the vibe, even in my eyes as I ask you that question, you're meant to say, fine, thanks, and then I'm going to move on. If I give you that impression, it's over. You're not going to have that. So if there is a way for us, just in those everyday interactions, to think a bit more creatively and learn to not just default to those answers, we begin to make it safe. And sometimes it, I'm, it, it'll be a bit clumsy. I might not say, you know, so it may just be, oh, it's, it's been a bit of a tough week, actually. Um, or or feel, feeling a bit overwhelmed. At just something that breaks the ice of, oh, I'm fine, thanks, or I'm really busy. So that's just a little practical thing. If you are fine, that's okay. God, God, God be praised. And if you are busy, just find another way of saying that instead of the B word. Um, sorry, that's my rant over. Um, this one, we, we've talked in kind of general terms. What about in terms of children, um, responding to anxious children? How do you respond to an anxious, anxious child whose only answer is, I don't know? If you, are, if you ask a question, all you get back is, I don't know. Any thoughts on particularly caring for children who might be struggling with anxiety? There are little techniques that you can use to get uh, children chatting. Obviously, I'm not a parent, uh, so I'm not coming at this from someone with experience in parenting, but I've done some work in counselling uh, with children over the years. And so there are little things like you can use pictures of happy faces, sad faces, worried faces, and you can get them to pick uh, one of those uh, faces and point to them, which one do they feel most like. They can identify their emotions that way. Uh, you can use stories, uh, one of their stories that they love, and they say, oh, who are you feeling like? Are you feeling like the bear today, or are you feeling like the rabbit today? Uh, and you can just help them kind of get themselves into the story and who they're identifying with. You can do that for Bible stories as well, um, uh, whatever they relate to. Uh, you can ask them things like, maybe slightly older children, though it can work with younger ones as well, what song would you like to sing now? What song would make things better? And actually, the song that they pick can give you a clue for what's going on inside their hearts. And sometimes they may not want to know, but maybe their teddy knows how they're feeling, or maybe their doll knows how they're feeling. Uh, and uh, isn't it astonishing that when a child is feeling ill, so often the teddy bear gets a temperature too, and the teddy bear needs to go to bed, and the teddy bear needs a bandage or a plaster on its nose or something like that. Children will often play out uh, uh, with their toys. And slightly older ones, you can do little things like draw something that looks a bit like a dartboard, uh, and the inner circle is uh, people that are supporting you and loving you. So as you go out, there's circles of people that you like. And then you've got the outer circle of people that are, uh, people that are worrying you or people that are being mean to you. And you, you can ask them to put different names of people in different parts of that sort of dartboard circle. And it can build up a, a flavor for who they feel safe with, 
and who they don't feel safe with. And that can uh, lead on to conversations like, oh, I see that person's right at the center. Tell me about how they're making you feel good right now. Oh, I see that person's right at the edge. Oh, can you tell me a little bit about how they're making you feel sad right now? If they're not artistic, just get out all the Lego bricks or every single toy in the house, turn the dining room into a kind of a dartboard, and Teddy goes there, and the Action Man goes over there, Barbie's over there. It, it can feel slightly chaotic, but get them talking um, uh, in, in physical ways. Children will often recoil slightly and climb up if it's a kind of an intense one-to-one -one situation. Uh, but if you can be doing something, making a cake, getting the Play-Doh out, uh, then they might talk a bit more fl freely. Clayton, you know more about parenting than I do. Uh, if, certainly if your kids are used to reading the Bible or you've read kids' Bible stories with them, uh, you know, we've talked about lots of big theological ideas, the sovereignty of God and God's sovereign over all the nations. And yet actually with kids, one of the things I found very helpful is just always taking them back to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Here's Jesus welcoming children because Jesus loves kids like you. Uh, and, and look, here's a, here's a lady who was sad and maybe she didn't have many friends and, and, and Jesus welcomed her. And, and was it Luke 7? Here's a, here's a mum who's, who's really sad because her kid has, has died uh, and Jesus is kind to her. And so rather than you know, unpacking the, the full depths of the sovereignty of God and uh, his, his superintending over all of creation, zoom in on Jesus. Here is, a, here is a friend who loves us, who cares for us, who's powerful and who wants us to come to him. Thank you. Other questions we've got. Um, well, this is, maybe we'll touch it. Is being anxious in itself something we should repent of? Is it, how should we think about anxiety? Because you mentioned there are things, but the Bible does say don't be anxious, as a, but you said get the tone of that right in our minds. Is it a sin issue, a suffering issue? Or how should we think about it? I think it's an all of the above issue. Um, so part of anxiety can be physiological. I, I don't think the Bible ever calls us to repent of our hormones being out of kilter or repent of a genetic predisposition to anxiety. There is certainly no call to repent when our body is not functioning uh, in the way that it should. And I don't think God ever gives us a hard time uh, when hard things are coming at us. He knows that that's going to be difficult and there's real suffering. And he, he wants us to, to run to him um, and not to feel guilty that we're struggling with some of the things that are happening. I mean, th some of the Psalms of lament are there to give us words to express how hard we're finding life. Mm. We don't have to be stoic and, and pretend everything's okay. But within that, I think anxiety can nudge us towards things that are ungodly that we probably do need to repent of. So in the midst of our anxiety, if we're going out and getting drunk, well, we don't have to repent of the genetic bits or the hard bits, but our response to it may well have been ungodly. Uh, in, in the middle of our anxiety, if we're d doubting God, well, we certainly want to turn around from that and actually come back to him. It's a change of direction there. So I, I don't put anxiety as a sin category, but I am very conscious that it can be the context of my sin. And it's just teasing out uh, those different things. That, that, seems, uh, that seems entirely right, I think, um, to me as well. It's, it's interesting that sometimes, if we were to add an extra category, uh, sometimes there is um, anxiety that comes from my sin. Uh, and the, the example you know, might be someone who, who, has, who gambles too much, who gambles a lot, uh, might be anxious about how am I going to pay the bills. Um, now, that's, that's an anxiety that comes from a sin, so we want to, we want to do with that. But very much as Helen has said, want to um, categorise a physiological uh, imbalance as a, as a different category that the Bible doesn't seem to be calling us to identify as sin and therefore need to repent of them. And I suppose the broader biblical teaching about, let's say, the flesh and the spirit, there's this category of flesh indwelling sin that remains in me very profoundly. So everything I do 
is in some sense tainted by sin. I could, I, could, I could give a talk on the sovereignty of God and there's sin in my heart in some way. It could be pride, it could be fear of man, it could be anything. So in a sense, being quick to repent and say, God, I know I've, I'm sure I'm not responding to everything in the right way. I'm sure I'm prone to doubt you or doubt your love or look to myself or feel proud. You know, there, there's always something. The repentance is, is a good part of our Christian lives that we don't have to pretend that we got it together. But um, along with the, the suffering and the sickness and the physiological things, we're not trying to beat ourselves up about those things. I, I love the parable of the prodigal son, uh, I guess just because I guess so many of us can relate to him. Uh, and I think anxiety can nudge us towards sitting in that pigsty. Uh, and, and wallowing in our sins sometimes. But the beautiful thing about repentance is it, it, it's not about going on a guilt trip. The beautiful thing about repentance is going, you know what, I'm better off close to my dad. Yeah. Uh, and that beautiful picture of him coming home. Yeah. And God is so happy when we repent yeah. uh, and come back to him. Keep, keep coming back to your dad. Thank you. Let's go. Last question here. This is sort of zooming out from the lens um, of, of individuals or even groups and church culture. But just when you look around everywhere, um, the whole, cult, whole country, it feels like anxiety is going up. Statistics seems to be that the numbers are going up. Is it actually more prevalent amongst us at the moment? Do you think anxiety has a struggle? Or is it just that we're talking about it more? Or it's kind of there's more options for counseling and treatment, so it's just more public. It's always been like this. Or do you think it's actually um, a, an increasing issue? The, the follow-up to that question, once you've had a think about that, is does the rise of social media and technology and the way that we interact make this worse? A any thoughts from you? I'll have, I'll have a stab. I think certainly on the first one, uh, one of the interesting things is we, when we see in Matthew 6 and... Luke 12, Jesus, when he tells us, tells his disciples not to worry, he ties the reason for that, the reason that we don't have to worry, to, very deliberately, to your heavenly Father knows what you need, which is wonderfully reassuring. But, of course, as our society drifts further and further from a relationship with a heavenly Father and a confidence that God knows what we need, well, absolutely one would expect that that worry is then going to increase. So I'm not across the, the uh, statistics and comparative studies with a generation ago, mm. but based on that very, very brief exegesis mm. of two parts of the Bible, absolutely I would say it seems entirely natural and you know, a natural consequence of that, mm. um, that there will be an increase in anxiety. Mm. Um, you're probably much better across actual facts and statistics than I am. Uh, no, probably not at all. Um, but uh, I, I think we are certainly talking about anxiety more. Uh, and that is a wonderful thing. I think for too many generations, that British stiff upper lip was uh, expected. And that did nobody any good. Anxiety just got squished down and came out in all kinds of unhelpful ways. Uh, so there probably is an element of truth in that we are just talking about it more. But that's a good thing, uh, that we can then bring it into the light uh, and, and get help for that, whether that's the secular help or bring it under God's word, which is... Uh, even more beautiful. Uh, but in terms of um, social media, social media can be a blessing and it can be beautiful, but it really encourages us to compare ourselves uh, to the people around us. You know, you go on social media and you see these people supposedly living this shiny, victorious life where the holidays are stunning and their children have just won the 13th gold medal of the week. And, uh, it, you know, we put on this kind of persona on social media sometimes, uh, which uh, encourages us to look at it and go, I don't measure up. I'm, I'm not good enough. My life is not as it should be. I'm not at the right parties. I'm not wearing the right clothes. I'm not achieving the right uh, career dreams. Uh, and I think that really can fuel a massive anxiety and a lack of contentment uh, in our lives. And I think as a church, we can be wonderfully countercultural. I have a personal rule. For every two, I mean, I, I'm not legalistic about this, but this is my general rule. For every two things that I put on social media that make me look, you know, maybe a little bit godly or a little bit fun, I put something on social media that makes me look a complete and utter muppet and people get to laugh at me. Uh, and I think, you know, the more we can encourage each other to do that as well, and just be real. Also, you don't want to put your deepest, darkest fears on social media, probably. It's not going to be a wise place, you know, 
People will interact in the most unhelpful of ways uh, if you put that on there. Uh, but the more we can just be a church where we are real on social media, the highs, appropriate highs and appropriate lows, uh, then I think we can start living in a social media world in ways that are far healthier. And maybe that will be a topic for a future good news for real life and social media. Um, we, we'll wrap up there. We, we'll be out of time. Um, books are available, some of the ones that Helen mentioned at the back, if you'd like to pick one up. There's some little leaflets as well with, with particular helps on this topic and others. We'll be around if you'd like to chat further. What we normally do is we, we'll send, if, if you signed up online, we'll send you a little link with some options for follow-up if you'd like to find out more. But please do talk to, to someone you know, trust, talk to any one of us. We'd love to keep helping one another. This is just a conversation starter to get us in the, in the right frame of mind. We hope this will help us ongoing. Clayton, would you be happy to pl close us in prayer? Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you that we hear Jesus' words telling us not to worry because you know what we need. And so I pray that we will hear those words, that we will remind each other of those words, that we will be convinced of your goodness and your sovereignty and that you work all things for our good. And Father, in those moments when that is hard to hear and hard to believe, help us care for each other well, help us to love, to listen, to be very, very gentle and to just gently and consistently point people to your great love for us that you've shown us in Christ. We pray that we might be a, a family who love well, who hear your word, and among whom your spirit works, that we might become more and more like Jesus. We thank you that you don't want us to be anxious, that you want us to have great confidence and assurance. And so I pray that each one here tonight and each one who's been watching online might be absolutely convinced of that as you demonstrate your love to us in Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen.